Today, as we gather to worship, we acknowledge the Ghana peoples, the first inhabitants of this place from time beyond remembering. We acknowledge that through this land, God nurtured and sustained the first peoples of this country, the Aboriginal and Islander peoples. We honour them for their custodianship on the land, of the land on which we gather today. We acknowledge that the first peoples had already encountered the Creator God before the arrival of the colonisers. The Spirit was already in the land, revealing God to the people through law, custom and ceremony. We acknowledge that the same love and grace that was finally and fully revealed in Jesus Christ sustained the First Peoples and gave them particular insights into God's ways. And so we rejoice in the reconciling purposes of God found in the good news about Jesus Christ. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 62, verses 5 to 12. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no confidence in extortion and set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay to all according to their work. We are going to sing together a song that reminds us that whoever we are, whatever has brought us here today, God has called each one of us to be here and he comes to gather us in. We're going to sing together from Together in Song, number 474. <laughs>
today and I welcome all of you who have joined us for worship today. Whether you have joined us in person here this morning or whether you are joining us through watching the video or listening to the audio recording. All who join and gather together in worship are a valued part of our community and our prayer is that you will be blessed and touched by the grace of God through being part of our worship today. We have Anne bringing beautiful music for us this morning. Josh will be reading the scriptures. Malcolm will bring us the message. And we have Ron and Aileen at the back doing the video and the audio. And we also thank all those who have contributed in some way towards this service coming together today. There's lots of people that do little things behind the scenes that may be unnoticed by some of us, but what everything that everyone does is very much appreciated. Now, I believe Malcolm has an announcement. Thanks, Kate. Uh, you might have uh, picked up your ears to uh, the call to worship that uh, Kate brought to us today, um, and that's acknowledgement of country. That's part of the preamble uh, for the Uniting Church's constitution. Um, over the, the many years, the Assembly has gathered, and they have worded and uh, sought to recognise and incorporate um, all Australians, and to recognise particularly uh, First Nations. We are aware that uh, there's a lot of tension these days in relation to Tuesday, a celebration of Australia Day. It's also known as Invasion Day and Survival Day. And, and there's a whole range of um, feelings and responses and attitudes and processing and how we as a community, how we as a nation embrace and encourage that. Um, so um, uh, there are a few things that people have done. Some services today uh, uh, have had a day of mourning uh, flavour. Um, we've chosen here to recognise um, the uh, First Nations. Uh, and uh, I came across um, a... Uh, a um, internet, um, online or TV program that's happening tomorrow evening, um, 7 o'clock here in our South Australian time frame. Uh, and it's by uh, Indigenous Christian leaders and they're calling for people to come together uh, in prayer uh, to recognise the past but to look positively to the future and how we can work together. Uh, there is a little video clip. Uh, we'll see if we can get that working. You are invited to the National Change the Heart prayer service on January 25th, simulcast on ACC TV, radio and online. This is a unique opportunity to be led by Aboriginal Christian leaders to pray together in unison to change the heart of Australia. Click on the link to find out more. There is that it's seeking to unite um, Christians right around Australia, uh, led by Indigenous Christian leaders that would want us to pray together for a positive future. Um, they did mention that you could uh, tune in on television, on the internet or on the radio. Life FM will be broadcasting it at 7 o'clock uh, tomorrow night. Um, you can, uh, on a laptop or a mobile device, watch on commongrace.org.au. Uh, and uh, if you've got Foxtel, it's on Channel 182 um, and uh, a few other programs. So I did copy some of those. If you are interested in watching it tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, I've got a copy that has those details rather than rely on our memories. So uh, I'd encourage us um, to uh, reflect and listen and take an opportunity to share with others um, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. We're now going to move into a time of prayer, of confession and praise. And our prayers of confession and praise this morning were written by a man called Alan Webster from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And they come from a, res a resource that's called Gifts from Open Hands, which brings together prayers and worship resources from lands all over the world. Let us pray. This week, we have heard whispers of your grace and we have not always listened. Those whispers have come from unlikely places and our ears were stopped 
because of our heart walls. Those whispers have challenged us in ways we prefer not to think about. Those whispers call us to places that look too different, too risky, too unsafe. For our selective deafness, we ask your forgiveness, Lord. But this last week, we have also heard and noticed songs of grace that have stayed with us in the unexpected warmth of a friend, in reminders of family, in the unlooked for kindness of strangers, in random beauty, heard, seen, tasted, smelled, felt, known in the deep places. And for these songs, we are grateful. We choose this morning to be carriers of goodness and grace. Amen. Friends, our God is indeed a God of grace, a grace that is ever present with us. Know then, deep within, that you are indeed forgiven. Thanks be to God. How have you experienced God's grace in this last week? This morning, the kids and I went for a walk along the beach at about 6.30 this morning. It was very hot. Um, as we came back along the beach, we were walking up and suddenly Amy stopped. Amy's my 10-year-old daughter sitting at the front, for those of you who don't know Amy. And from her clothes that she was wearing, she pulled out $30, her Christmas and birthday money. And she said, Mum, sorry, Amy, I hope I'm not embarrassing you too much. <laughs> she said, Mum, I would really like to buy everyone in the family a special drink. Those of you who live around the Hove area might know that there's a coffee van that comes down to the Esplanade. And so with her birthday and Christmas money, she bought each of us a special drink. And it was such a beautiful moment of grace. I invite you now to stand and stretch and share with the people around you a moment that you have experienced of grace this week. And if anyone doesn't feel comfortable to do that, just say hello to the pe people around you. wonderful to hear such a buzz of conversation as people were sharing the moments that they've experienced God's grace through this week. We're now going to sing together from Together in Song number 703 as the Deer Pants. Together in Song number 703. <laughs>
this morning, the first thing that she did in our call to worship was to read from Psalm 62. And verse 5 says, For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. Those words were written a long, long time ago. And they talk about wanting to find God. They talk about my soul or the innermost part of our being. And they talk about silence and waiting in silence. For many years, well, as long as I can remember, our world has been always busy. And it just seems to have gotten faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And now with technology and phones and computers and laptops, we have been encouraged to try and do several things at once. They call it multitasking. But I think they're discovering now that multitasking isn't as it, they thought it was going to be. And now there's encouragement for people to spend time on focusing on one thing and doing one thing well. And I think one of the things that we've learnt over the last 12 months, because we've been forced to stop running around and travelling all overseas and running around and often spending time at home um, and not being distracted, many people have discovered the wisdom from long, long, long ago that it's okay to be still. It's okay to be quiet. It's okay to wait in silence. But again, it depends on what you're waiting for. Because sometimes you can get frustrated if you're waiting for someone else to get ready, or if you're waiting for dinner to happen, or if you're waiting for your brother or your sister to finish eating their peas so that you can get dessert. Sometimes that can be frustrating. So waiting in silence for God is something that people are discovering again and that it's all right to stop and to be still and to listen. And some people tend to think, oh, well, that mainly is only for older people, that young people couldn't do that because they've got too much energy, to their minds are too busy and their muscles are so eager to run, jump and do all sorts of things. Well, just as they thought that multitasking was the best, to think that young people have too much energy to be still and silent has been proven wrong by there are many young people. In fact, there are some schools over the last two or three years who in their primary schools have started to teach the year ones and receptions how to stop and how to be still and how to listen. I would encourage us all, older ones and younger ones, to make a choice to spend some time being still. It's good to pick up our Bible and to read verses. And I know when I was at Sunday school, there used to be prizes for the ones that you could memorize. And who memorized the most used to get a little tag or a te text picture. And we thought we were great. So it is good to know God's word. And it is good to maybe take just one verse or a couple of words and just to pause and spend five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes being still and quiet and just waiting for God. Because that last song talked about as a deer pants, as a deer gets thirsty, yearning to find the stream, so my soul longs for you, Lord. It's important for us to not only do things, but also to build our soul, our innermost being, and spend some time in quiet and silence. And you might find, you might think that that's hard for me to do because I like talking. And during church, I do a lot of talking. But when I'm not at church in my role as being the preacher, I spend some time being still and silent and listening listening for God and calming those thoughts because you know sometimes we think and think and think and think and think and think and think well sometimes it's okay to maybe even breathe and slow our bodies down and slow our thoughts down and just be there 
for God to bless us. Sometimes we might get a word from God. We might think, oh, that's a good thought. And sometimes we might just go through the time and not have any wisdom or insight. And that's okay. Because that's what waiting for God means. Waiting and being still and silent. So in the next few days, I'd encourage you to say, I'm going to spend five minutes being still and quiet. So find a spot in your house, or if it's not too hot, you could even go outside in the garden or on the beach. But find a spot and just be still and try and relax and breathe and just say, God, I'm waiting. And if you can do that, then maybe you might want to do it again another day. And if you do that, you might want to do it again another day. So the Bible encourages us to be still and to wait for God because God is worth waiting for and our hope is in God. Well, thanks for being still and listening to me. Maybe that might be a help for when you pause and make a choice to stop and listen to what God might say. Thanks for listening. Our first Bible reading comes from Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days' walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second Bible reading comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus. Well, the story of Jonah... The way in which we mostly deal with Jonah is we invite our children to reflect upon the story of Jonah and the whale. And uh, some of us in our adults' uh, experience and wisdom tend to think, well, this must be a bit of a fictional story because um, it's improbable. It's, a, it's more a fairy tale, something like um, you know, Pinocchio and Geppetto in the whale in Disney's uh, interpretation of that fairy tale. The story of Jonah and God, uh, the story of Jonah and Nineveh, uh, and the Bible reading that um, uh, Josh brought to us is sort of stuck in the middle. We don't hear about uh, Jonah's interaction with God before that, and we don't hear the disgust and the contempt that Jonah had uh, after God pardoned Nineveh. So we're sort of just looking in the middle passage. But we find that that whole story relates to something of of how God seems to be in charge and in control of, of the world. 
that God manipulates our lives and pushes us and makes uh, things happen so that eventually we will turn around and do what God says. And then when we do, God goes and changes his mind. It's a bit of a story that tries to uh, explain something of how God engages with us in humanity. And there's something about that that doesn't really sit well. If our only holy scripture record was Jonah, we might be excused for believing that that's how God operates. But Jonah is just one book, one story of one man and his engagement and interaction with God and people. And we can see that right through the rest of scripture, there are a whole different ways in which people and communities engage with God and the way in which God teaches and blesses and engages them. But through all the stories and over the top of all and each of the, those stories, in fact, even the story of Jonah, there is God's great mercy. So it's a challenge for us to try and work out what is God trying to teach us through this story of Jonah? Um, one of the things that comes out is that the way in which it all unpacks, it's unexpected we find that at the beginning God speaks to Jonah and calls him on a mission. And we would anticipate that God, Jonah being the prophet and the fact that this book in the Bible has his name and that he is the prophet recording his story, we would anticipate that he would have obeyed and gone, but he doesn't. He heads the other way. And we find that there's a storm and we find that there are people who are not followers of Jehovah they are pagans, and yet they see that working out that the problem is caused from Jonah and he hasn't been obedient to God, so they seek to get rid of him. They throw him over the, the edge into the sea, and everything calms down. It's almost as if Jesus was there calming the storm, and yet these were people not known to be followers of Jehovah, and yet their actions cause the sea to calm. And we find Jonah drifting down into the depths, only to be swallowed by this huge fish. Unexpected. All through the way, you know, you think, oh, maybe he's been digested, but no, he's in there three days, and then he gets spewed onto the beach. It's a lovely story in which it's been crafted, but it's full of unexpected turns. And finally, when Jonah's there dripping um, on the uh, edge of the beach, he de decides that, yes, he will do what God calls him to do. And so he journeys to Nineveh. And then, as Josh read, it's a huge city, three days' walk across. And he only gets a third of the way through declaring the gospel, declaring the news of God, that these people would have to turn or face destruction. And they do. Not just one or two, but the whole community. And not only do they recognize their mistakes, they put on sackcloth. They mourn their failure. They recognize their mistakes and they seek about an abrupt change. It's not just enough to recognize that we've made mistakes. It's about that word repent, to mourn the pain and the grief that your life has caused and to seek to make a difference. If only people today would not only recognize the mistakes that they've made, but mourn and grieve and seek to make a better life. Maybe things would be different in Australia. Maybe things would be different in America if people followed that pattern of not only recognizing your mistake, but grieving over it and seeking restitution through God. And then, of course, there's that unexpected way in which when they do that, God changes his mind and the destruction that was prophesied doesn't occur. Does that mean that the prophet was wrong? Or maybe there's a bigger message that God overall is seeking to give us mercy and forgiveness all along. 
So for whatever we think about Jonah's story, whether we think it's a, it's a story that teaches us uh, something of God's wisdom, or if we believe that it actually happened and that there were those things that uh, surprised us and the miracles of all those things that were evident there, the thing that we can't deny is that Jonah was a participant, that Jonah interacted with God, that Jonah engaged he wasn't an observer. Even in his decision to move the other way, he actively chose to move. We live in a world today where we've got so many mobile devices and when something happens in our streets or in our towns or around us, what's the first thing people do? They go for their phone. We take a camera, a picture. We take a video. It's good to have those resources, and there are many things that we can look back at later. But what it does is it encourages us to be observers. We stand back so we can get a better view. We take a photo. This story of Jonah and his deliberation with God shows that right or wrong, Jonah is there. And he engages, he interacts. He just doesn't sit back and watch. We might be excused for feeling that we're not prophets, that God has never spoken to us verbally. You may have had an experience where you've heard God's voice, but many of us don't. And we live our day-to-day -day lives without an epiphany or a revelation. Maybe, as we've encouraged the children this morning, maybe if we took a little more time to be still and to wait on God, we might get a little more clarity on what God is seeking in our lives and how we should live. The second reading that Josh brought to us was from Mark's Gospel, and Mark's key word in his Gospel, it's the shortest Gospel, and they tell us it was the first one written, is immediately. Mark is a man of action and he records things. This, 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 Jesus said, and then this happened. We find in that reading, John is arrested and imprisoned and Jesus moves into Galilee, proclaiming God's news. Like Jonah walking through Nineveh, the kingdom of God has come, repent, turn around, see that God is present with you. As we sung um, in the first hymn this morning, not in, the, in the, the building, not in heaven light years away, but here and now in the moment where we live, in your place, in your walk, in your day-to-day -day area, the kingdom of God is present. And how do you engage with it? How do you respond to God's presence? And we find, as, the, as Mark continues on, that Jesus meets Simon and Andrew and speaks to them and calls them to follow. And then we think, oh, wow, they turned around and did. And he moves a little bit further on and finds James and John, fishermen like Simon and, and Andrew, and calls them. And they did. And for us, that's a lovely story. And we've been taught that's how it happened. And for those of us who can remember flannel graphs, you probably in Sunday school sat up and taught or saw Jesus and then the fishermen by their boats and Jesus walking up and saying, follow me. And then they instantly, immediately followed him. Because of our difference and our distance from that first century culture, we miss out on the unexpected way in which those things happen. This was the opposite way of the day. If you wanted to follow a rabbi or a teacher, you went to him and you sat around him and you listened to him and when he moved, you moved. And it was a struggle, a survival of the fittest, if you like. Those who were the most disciplined, those who were the most devoted to the teacher would earn the right to be a disciple. The teacher wouldn't go around and find people. He would teach and those who valued him would come along and follow. 
and it was only the best who stayed, who would be encouraged, who would be recognised. You might sit around and follow the teacher, but if the teacher didn't think you were worthy enough, he would move on and not really engage you or involve you. And I think I've mentioned one time in a sermon last year, I'm not expecting you to remember because I can't even remember, where we talked about the way in which Jewish boys grew up in that culture and they learnt their scriptures, they learnt the law. And those who managed and survived would continue. And those who struggled to memorise it, there were no textbooks, those who struggled to memorise it went off and did another skill or another craft. And those who managed and went to a high level, they continued until they could no longer do any more. And then they continued uh, until, 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 and they became rabbis and teachers themselves. But it was only the best of the best who were chosen to do that. Those along here who drifted off and who couldn't memorise or didn't have the ability to, to focus in the same way, they became fishermen. They became leather makers. They became cooks or bakers. They did other things, followed their family business. But only those who were excellent students and who were the best were able to follow a rabbi or to be a rabbi. And here we have Jesus seeing two guys at work saying, follow me. I choose you. I want you to be part of my group. This was unexpected. No wonder there was that response to immediately follow. This was winning honour and respect, even though they had known that well, they weren't really that good at schoolwork. They went into fishermen, into fishing. James and John followed the same thing. They had a bigger business. They had a dad and other hired men. And yet they choose because Jesus noticed and engaged with them. This story shows to us that those who follow Jesus we're not the best of the best. We are chosen by God. And then you can say, well, God chooses everybody. But the thing is, God chooses us all for us to engage and for us to live the life that God has blessed us with. The calling and the recognition of who we are as God's people is not a second-rate occupation. It's not because we failed at something else or we weren't good enough to do it on our own. It shows to us that God's grace and mercy overall comes to all people and calls us to participate in a kingdom of love and grace and peace and encourages us for us to see that we have a commitment to do and be the best that we can be to recognise our skills and our talents and to build upon that so that all of community will be blessed, that all of community will see that there is an option to participate in love and grace and mercy. And it's not based upon our financial status or our heritage or our family or um, our education status. It's based upon our humanity and our ability to live and to love. So I would encourage us to see that here in this place, whatever challenges we face, whatever limitations we have, whatever possibilities and successes that we have experienced in our life, that God calls us to participate and engage, that God calls us to follow because we have been chosen and selected as God's people and that God seeks to bless us and to inform us and to engage us in making a difference in the world in which we live. God calls us to do that individually. God calls us to do that in community. A couple of weeks ago we recognised those um, who had recently come and joined our community and our church and we welcomed them. Following that, we acknowledge those who've taken on responsibility as leaders in our community 
and we recognised and prayed a blessing upon them as they continue to lead us as God's people. We also recognise that today there is an opportunity for us to also covenant our involvement and our engaging in God's work, in the kingdom of God. There are no observers. There are no picture takers in God's community. We all have a role to do what we can and God calls us and challenges us and empowers us to do that. So I invite us today, just at this moment, there'll be some words on the screen for us to reflect on as we would covenant together as God's people. If you are able, I'd invite you to stand. Let's share together in a statement of belief that uh, we together acknowledge. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. These are a statement of belief, what we believe, and yet our lives, based on those beliefs, beliefs are called to be in action. The following slide, uh, if we would share together in the bold print, which is really acknowledging what the, um, the lighter print words before are expressing. For we are called to be a worshipping community, offering all to God in prayer. We are called to be a missionary community, making known the redeeming love of God. We are called to be a sacrificial community, generously giving from all that God has given us. We are called to be an inclusive community, sharing the hospitality of God's kingdom with all. And we are called to be a prophetic community, challenging plowers that oppress and corrupt. These things that we promise that we are called and recognised to do are not just worshipping here in the church. They're not just about missionaries overseas. They're not just about financially generously giving. They're not just about being hospitable to each other. And they're not just about challenging each other, but making a difference in our community. So as a gospel people, let us covenant together before God and each other. Let us share in this covenant. Creating and redeeming God, we give you thanks and praise. Your covenant of grace was made for our salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord. We come this day to covenant with you and our companions in discipleship, to watch over each other and to walk together before you in ways known and still to be made known. Pour down your spirit on us. Help us so to walk in your ways that the promises we make this day and the life that we live together may become an offering of love, our duty and delight, truly glorifying to you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Amen. This day, we give ourselves again to the Lord and to each other, to be bound together in fellowship and to work together in the unity of the Spirit for the sake of God's mission. In our congregation, in local partnerships, in our presbytery and synod, 
we commit all that we have and all that we are to fulfil God's purposes of love. Now may this God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing, that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever ever and ever. Amen. We've made these promises. We've looked at the front of the screen. Before we sit down, turn around and see who has made these promises with you. Please be seated and let's encourage each other as we would seek to serve God in this place and in this community. We now come to the prayers of the people and these prayers and our offering prayer today are adapted from prayers by Dorothy McRae McMahon. There will be moments of silence in which you are invited to pray in silence for the people and places that are on your heart today. Let us pray. For whom will we pray, O oh God? For what will we pray? The world swirls around us in its pain and need. Our church struggles to know what to do in response to that. Maybe if we remain silent before you, your wise spirit will pray for us. Come to us and make your way clearer to us, O Spirit of Truth. Draw near to your world in its warfare and woundedness. Draw near to those who struggle to survive. Draw near to those who are lonely and afraid. These are the people whom we remember before you. Draw near to your church in its frailty and wandering from your way. Draw near to us and challenge us if we have fenced in your love and kept it to ourselves. Expand our vision so that the world will see the light of your life among us. Draw near to each one of us today O oh God, who sees and cares. Reach out towards us and speak tenderly to us that we may discover your life of hope and courage closer than we had ever imagined. Take all our humble efforts here and add them to your truth and grace. For we ask this in faith. Amen. And now let us join together with the church across the generations and around the world as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Although we no longer pass offering bags because of the adaptations we've had to make due to COVID, there was an opportunity to place offerings in the box that was found at the rear of the church, either as you came or as you leave. And also there are many who will have made their offerings electronically. We'll now have a time where we will dedicate these offerings to God. Let us pray. God of generosity and kindness, we will never be able to match your open heart, but we pray that you will take what we have given and add it to your own gifts of love. Amen. So may we go out into this world as a community of God's people, a community made up of individuals, parts that recognise the role in which they play. May we be a worshipping community. May we spend time in prayer during this week. May we be a missionary community, making known Jesus, living lives following Jesus. May we be sacrificial as a community in giving generously of our time, of our kindness, of our thoughts, of our resources. May we be inclusive, hospitable to strangers, to people we don't know, to people we do know. May we be a prophetic community, challenging others to a deeper life, to living below the surface, to seeking God. May we be God's people. Go in God's name. Serve your Saviour and be touched by the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>